I'm gonna pull my speech out just in case the teleprompter has an issue, excuse me. Thank you to everyone at the USC School of Cinematic Arts for allowing me to be a part of this truly incredible day. Thank you, Dean Daly, for having me here and for all of the amazing strides the film program has taken under your leadership from where the school where I was to start it now is truly amazing. I'm not bitter or anything about that. I'm just very happy for these students. <laughs> so happy, like just, just happy for them. <laughs> Also, side note, my kids don't think I'm a big deal, but getting an award that Kevin Feige, Chandra Rhimes, Brian Grazer, and James Ivory have proves I am. If they were here, I'd tell them, suck it. Um, <laughs> they could also get to see all these white people listening to me, so this will be on YouTube, right? That's cool. That's cool. Also, side side note, Dean Daly, my son Ben, who's 12, wants to go to film school here when he graduates, so I'm hoping this award comes with a free scholarship. Yes? No? All right. Reparations. All good. Okay, here we go. What's up, class of 2022? Congratulations. Out here being cinematic in a pandemic. I see you. I'm so incredibly honored to receive the Mary Pickford Award. It's such a humbling feeling to be appreciated and recognized by the very school that shaped my professional career. It's also mind blowing because the first Mary Pickford Award was given to Robert Zemeckis the year I graduated. I remember seeing him and being like, oh snap, that's the Back to the Future dude. <laughs> I also remember being in your shoes and thinking, can the Back to the Future dude keep it brief because I'm trying to turn up tonight. So I will respect y'all wishes and keep it brief and to the point. As I was trying to figure out what to say, I was really unsure. It's a lot of pressure, especially for a comedy writer. It's hard to take things so serious. I mean, you want it to be profound for the faculty, but you also know the students don't care. And then I realized that is exactly what being a comedy writer is. It's stressing what the network thinks about every episode, only for the fans to crush you with a tweet like, that's trash. So this is a very familiar place for me to be. However, getting this award did make me reflect on how I got here. It made me think about what I would have wanted someone to tell me about the career I was going into. I mean, you didn't exactly pick an industry that has a clear path for success. I mean, a doctor goes to med school, residency, then becomes a doctor, a lawyer goes to law school, takes the bar, then starts a practice, but a filmmaker, I don't know how you start. I mean, do you make a short about a Twitter thread? Do you shoot a music video? Do you get in the Sundance Lab? Is your last name the Wayans? Do you do an OnlyFans? There's just so many valid entry points these days. But as I was sitting in your shoes, the one statement I didn't realize I would need to hear the most is, you don't know why you go through stuff. So let me take you slightly back to the beautiful year of 1977. <laughs> I had begged my parents to take me to see a little art house movie known as Star Wars, which I fell in love with that movie right away. Even though I was four, I knew at that moment I wanted to make movies for the rest of my life. I saw it at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood and across the street there was a restaurant called Hamburger Hamlet. For those that don't know what Hamburger Hamlet is, it's bougie hamburgers and velvet booths. Like you had to wear a sweater to go there, like classy burgers, guys. I had a Shirley Temple with two cherries, in case you were wondering. At the restaurant, as I raved about how amazing the movie was, my parents informed me they were getting divorced. It was the best and worst of days. My parents were definitely not destined to make it if you knew them. My mom was from upper middle class Chicago. Everyone on that side of the family is super college educated. So my mom, growing up, was like, if it's white, it's right. If white kids doing it, you're doing it too. My father, on the other hand, comes from a big family from a farm in Oklahoma where they weren't college educated but were self-made entrepreneurs. And my dad was like, we only mess with black stuff. Black businesses, black people, black toys. It was lonely only playing with a Lando Calrissian action figure. <laughs> but when they divorced, they had this weird agreement, which was if I went to a black school, I had to play sports in summer camp with white kids. And if I went to a white school, I had to play sports in a black neighborhood. So this is the early 80s, the beginning of hip hop. 
So at my school, my friends were listening to Run DMC, LL Cool J, all big actors now. Uh, and I went to this white summer camp in the Valley where they weren't listening to any of that. And just for reference of how white this summer camp was, I was the only, only person of color there. So much so, they would give me extra hats and t-shirts, which I thought was cool, until I realized they were putting me in different outfits for the brochure to make it seem like the camp had more diversity. <laughs> so it'd be me in a visor or me in a Native American headdress. I was completely oblivious, thinking, cool, I get to be Tonto, having no idea. Anyway, at this camp, no one is listening to hip hop. They were listening to Tears for Fears, Culture Club, the B-52s. So I had to spend all summer learning those songs. But also, I'm learning no hip hop over the summer. So when I go back to my black school, I'm like, hey guys, you ever heard of Kajagoogoo? And they were like, get the hell out of here. As they should have, Kajagoogoo's not a great band. But, but I'd have to spend the whole year learning hip hop again. And that cycle of trying to navigate both worlds for eight years and finding out how to survive when you don't quite fit in was how I spent my life up until high school. The whole time I'm asking myself, why am I going through this? Fast forward to 1991, starting film school here at USC. John Singleton had just come out with Boys in the Hood. I remember people coming up to me saying, you're gonna be the next John Singleton. We know why. But and <laughs> I was like, bet. I'll graduate at 21, be nominated for an Oscar, make millions, I'm with it. I was not the next John Singleton. Instead, it took nine years after I graduated to get my first job. Along the way, I wrote really bad internet animation, I wrote music videos, I worked at Disney Imagineering, but finally I had to get jobs working as a substitute teacher, I had to be a tutor at a group home, and the one I hated the most was a nonprofit. Not that I didn't love what we were helping, it was AIDS, you can't hate helping people deal with AIDS, but it was the monotony of the nonprofit work for a field I just didn't want to get into. So just for the record, helping people with AIDS, good, filling out tedious forms, bad. But I remember at one point, so bad that my grandfather literally said, so that film school thing, that's, that's still something? Now the whole time I'm doing these other jobs that I hate, I'm watching other friends from film school succeed. Not that I wasn't happy for them, like I'm happy for you guys with this great film school now, but I would just be slightly more happy if it was happening for me. The whole time asking myself, why am I going through this? Once I realized I wanted to write for television, I also realized I didn't know how to do it. I didn't take a lot of TV writing classes at school. So I had to humble myself by going back to school and take TV writing classes at UCLA Extension to get better. To which my grandfather also said, so you're doubling down on this thing? I worked, at, I worked during the day and I took classes at night, really asking myself, why am I going through this? After nine years, I finally got my shot on a show called Girlfriends, created by the amazing Mar Brock Akil. And the room was mostly people of color. Shout out to Kenya Barris, he was in the room with me. But I couldn't believe it had finally happened. I learned so much in my four years on that show. It was an incredible experience. However, the last season, the writer's strike happened and all the black shows were canceled. So I had to go work on mainstream shows. White. But I didn't know what to expect. I quickly found out that I was the only black person or person of color sometimes in the room. And not just on one show, not just twice, but four or five shows. But then a light bulb went off. I had been here before. Suddenly days of being on a brochure and wearing a Native American headdress were coming back to memory. Sure, it's not great being the only one, but I know what this looks like. I know how to survive here. I know how to navigate this. I know how to find my place when no space is made for me. And that's what I did. I could focus on the work without letting my environment throw me off. That's what I had gone through what I did as a Billy Idol, careless whisper singing kid. And that's what I was able to do now. Fast forward to 2015 when I see that Issa Rae needs a showrunner for Insecure. You know, shout out to Issa. I had seen the web series a little bit, but I didn't know what the script was going to look like. Once I read it, I see it's about a black person who grew up in my neighborhood that works at a nonprofit, you guys know how I feel about that, and is the only black person at her job, and she's frustrated that her passion is taking a long time to happen. What? It was like God's trifecta of my suffering presented itself. Then another light bulb went off. Oh, I know this world. That's why I went through my time at that beautiful nonprofit. 
That's what I went through nine years of waiting for my career to happen, so I could understand that character. Like a lot of us, I've had so many moments where my life and career have intersected, but I remember getting insecure and realizing that I had been asking myself the wrong question. The question was not, why am I going through this? It's essentially an unanswerable question, and it also made me a victim. The question I should have been asking myself is, what can I learn while I go through this? See, when I pose that back to myself that way about growing up, I could have embraced being an outsider more. When my career took longer to happen, I could have embraced having more fortitude and faith. When I had to take jobs that I hated, I learned how to embrace to handle my business, no matter how I felt about my current circumstance. Now, you're going into a career that my same grandfather said, and again, I quote, I don't get it. But in this career, you will have many, many peaks and valleys. You will ask yourself many times, why am I going through this? It could be over how long it takes to get your first job. It could be why your pilot didn't sell. It could be why your actor dropped out. It could be why can't I get an agent or under manager. It could be a million things. It's inevitable. It will not leave you. What I'll say is never try to answer it. Because the truth is you don't know right now. It's a fool's errand. But I promise you, if you hold on to I will benefit from this in the future, even if I don't know how today, you will learn so much more that will benefit you in the long run. With that, I hope the dude that made Insecure didn't speak too long. To the class of 2022, I wish you nothing but the best. And when you find yourself asking, why am I going through this? Keep your head down, persevere, and be confident that life will always answer the question soon enough. Thank you.